Today's episode of Just the Tip Tuesday is brought to you by CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. Right now, CK is running an awesome deal on their MT200 ACDC TIG welder now through the end of March. The MT200 comes with everything you need right out of the box to start TIG welding, except the consumables and gas. The MT200 is a complete TIG welding system capable of 5 amp arc starts, and it has a compact portable design weighing in at just 32 pounds. And it's dual voltage, so you can run off 115 or 220 volt. And it boasts an easy to use interface to help you get set up to weld in a flash. The MT200 ACDC is the answer to both creativity and production driven TIG welding. This innovative TIG machine provides the ability to quickly and efficiently adapt to dynamic welding situations while maintaining the quality of experience you come to know and love from CK Worldwide. Get your MT200 today for just $19.95 along with other genuine CK Worldwide parts and accessories through your local authorized CK distributor. Not sure where your closest distributor is? No problem. Head on over to ckworldwide.com and click on the Find a Dealer tab. It's that easy. CK Worldwide, the standard in TIG welding. And now, let's get into the episode. biggest pet peeves when it comes to welding and i see it all over social media whether it's facebook instagram tiktok youtube whatever the case may be i even see it in person on occasion and what i want to talk about today is base metal preparation and i get new welders all the time dming me on instagram and facebook asking me for feedbacks on the welds which i don't mind doing you know send me a screenshot of what you got you know i'll kind of help you get dialed in and tuned in but the first thing I look at, and 90% of the time, there, there's, no, there's no prep work done whatsoever. It's just two pieces of material slapped together, and then they threw some weld wire in there. Regardless of the process, no prep work has been done. Everyone wants to make beautiful welds, you know, very similar to what they see on social media, but they skip the prep work, and you just can't do that. You see all these nice, beautiful pipe welds. what they do? They peeled back the paint. They ground everything off. They cleaned it up, and, you know, they put a good-looking weld on there. Same thing with, you know, Fillet welds and groove welds, you can always see that the mill scale has been taken back, the paint's been taken back, the material's been prepped and cleaned. So the best thing you can do to get repeatable results is solid prep work. And you want to make this a habit and a routine. I never just slap two pieces of metal together and, you know, start welding on it without doing prep work. Even if I'm trying to dial in a machine, you know, I always make sure to grind my pieces or, you know, prep them up properly before I throw a weld on there. You know, just so I can make sure that the weld I'm going to make, you know, for the project or the part that matters, I went ahead and dialed it in on a piece of material very similar to what I'm going to be welding on. So I'll take scrap material, I'll grind it, clean it, whatever the case may be, and then I'll put it, you know, tack it together and then weld something up and then get my settings dialed in. Now, I'm not going to BS anybody. When I was out in the field, you know, as a, a young iron worker, just learning how to do a lot of this welding stuff, I never prepped anything. I didn't clean off any base metal. I didn't, you know, grind the paint off. I, we stuck it together and, and kind of scratched a little bit of the paint off so we get the weld started. And then we just run with it and weld. And I was just doing what I was taught. You know, that's what I was shown. I thought I was doing everything right. And I'd weld over paint and rust and oil and water and all kinds of other crap. And then wonder, man, why am I getting this porosity? Why aren't my, you know, the toes wetting in, you know, like they're supposed to. Now, mind you, most of this welding was, you know, it was done on stick welding with red iron. And, you know, stick welding can be pretty forgiving for the most part when welding over red oxide paint and some other coatings, but it was difficult to get consistent results when I didn't prep the joints properly. And as I got further along into welding, I eventually learned and realized that if I wanted consistent results, I needed to start doing some prep work and cleaning my base metals properly. And I also learned how important the prep work actually was. I'd say 80% of the work that needs to be done to ensure we have a good weld, you know, aside from all the cutting and fitting and stuff like that, it's going to be your prep work. The other 20% is the actual technical skills as it relates to welding. You know, and I, and I talked to so many different people on the podcast and stuff, and they, we always discuss prep work. 
You know, I mean, that's that's going to make or break you in some cases. You can't make chicken soup with chicken shit. It's just not going to happen. You, you got to take some time, put in a little bit of effort, and clean your material up. So let's go ahead and talk about base metal prep. So I'm going to talk about today steel, stainless, and aluminum. Just some quick little tips on, you know, how I prep my material to get ready to weld on it. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with mild steel because that's my favorite. Plain old vanilla mild steel. Very basic stuff, uh, but I love working with steel. You know, like I said, I'm a structural steel iron worker at heart. Uh, you know, that's one of the materials that I love the most. So hot rolled mild steel has mill scale on it, and it's a hard coating on the surface. And the mill scale is created during the manufacturing process. As the material rolls through all these different rollers and is very hot and everything, as soon as that material, you know, interacts with the oxygen, it creates mill scale. And that layer of mill scale should be removed prior to welding. And removing the mill scale is going to allow us to achieve a better looking weld, a better quality weld. And to reinforce this, I always do a class project with new students every year. We start off by, I have them make a block, you know, a couple pieces of steel together. It's got four sides on there, four little fillet welds. And I have them take the mill scale off of two of those corners and then leave the other two, you know, with the mill scale on them. And I show them, you know, say, you know, clean up this, these two sides here leave this side intact, and I want you to go ahead and weld these out. And I let them, you know, weld both sides, and then I can show them exactly how much better the welds look on the side that we actually took the time to prep it and clean all the mill scale off versus the side we just stuck together and welded out. You can see an instant difference in the welds. And my method for removing mill scale is first, I like to use a hard rock. Flap discs seem like they work really good because they're really aggressive up front and they do a lot of removal pretty quick but they don't last very long because they start to glaze over. They get that mill scale caught up on the surface or whatever, and it just glazes up. It burns them up a lot quicker. So I like to take a hard rock, get down to the bare base, white metal, clean metal, and then I'll follow that up with a flap wheel just to smooth everything out, take out all the deep gouges, scratches, and all that stuff, maybe reshape my bevel a little bit. You'll notice that by removing the mill scale, your welds are actually going to flow a lot better. You're going to have a lot better control of your puddle. It's just going to flow right into the sides. You're going to get good wetting action to the toes. Overall bead appearance is going to improve. And I try to clean my steel as much as possible prior to welding. Now, if we're running stick welding or doing some flux core, we really don't need to clean the base metal as much because we have scavenging elements and deoxidizers and stuff in the flux. It's going to help with poor base metal prep because a lot of the stuff it's, you know, let's face it, it's meant for the, the field. And there's just not a whole lot of time to do the prep work out there. I mean, you're blowing and going, getting stuff knocked out. And a lot of times, you know, you just, they won't let you stop and clean this stuff up. They're just like, hey, you know, weld it, put it together, slap it in there. And, you know, you know, turn me up 10, you know, and just burn that shit out. But that's not always the case. I, even in the field, I try to remove the paint and all the other stuff just because you're supposed to. You know, D11 says you're supposed to remove all this stuff, so you should take the time and do it. Uh, they're going to paint over it anyway, but you're going to get a much better weld if you take the mill scale paint and hydrocarbons and all that stuff off there. You're not going to have to deal with the porosity. You're going to get smooth, consistent, clean beads. It's going to allow you to plan out your next pass if you're doing multi-pass welds because everything's nice, smooth, and clean. Now, when we get into MIG welding with like solid wires, you're going to notice a significant difference if you don't remove the mill scale. So most of our 70S6 wires, they typically contain manganese and silicon and they do okay with light to medium mill scale, but once again, it's not an ideal situation. You want to remove the mill scale to help with that puddle fluidity. Watch everything tie in and the wetting of the toes. It's going to be a much smoother bead profile. In addition to that, you know, if we're doing mild steel with TIG welding, you know, we have 70S6 and 70S2. Those are pretty popular. 70S2 wire does not do well with mill scale, right? You want to take that off. You want to clean it, get it down to bright, shiny metal, Buff it with a uh, flap disc. Make sure everything's nice and clean because 70S2 is does not do a great job with, you know, any type of mill scale on there. So make sure you clean that up really well. 70S6 is a lot more of a forgiving wire. That's why I typically like to use that for the most part when I'm doing mild steel because it's a little bit more forgiving. Aside from moving the mill scale and maybe buffing it up with a flap wheel, you really don't need to go much further. You don't have to get too crazy unless your steel has like paint or grease or oils or other hydrocarbons on them. A little bit of degreaser spray can remove most of the stuff. Um, I like to use purple power soap. You know, if this stuff's saturated in it, you spray that on there, purple power soap, you mix it up, and then you can hit it with a garden hose. Once it's dry, you know, take your mill scale off. You're pretty much ready to go. You don't have to get too carried away with it. 
And it's pretty common, you know, to have some oils on there from the manufacturers or the suppliers because sometimes they'll put like a light coat of oil on the steel to just to prevent it from rusting, you know, until it's been delivered to the customer. So as you can see, steel's pretty easy to deal with for the most part. Get rid of the oils and paints, knock off the mill scale, and you're pretty much good to go. You can buff the material with a flap wheel if you're feeling froggy, but it's not really a necessity. I like to do it, especially, you know, if I'm doing um, any sort of, uh, you know, groove welds or anything like that, just because the puddle seems to flow so much better, you know, by, by buffing everything smooth, making sure you get a nice, clean, smooth, shiny edge on there. The puddle just, you know, it seems to flow effortless, effortlessly. Easy for you to say, right? Um, and I, I just get better weld consistency if I take that, that buffing wheel or that uh, flapper disc and clean everything up nice and smooth. Right after steel, stainless steel is pretty much, you know, it's pretty, for the most part, pretty easy to clean and prep. I like to prep my stainless with a little bit of acetone or dechlorinated brake clean. And it's pretty simple. doesn't require a whole lot of effort to get this stuff clean for the most part. I mean, you might have some, uh, you know, from the different cutting processes that you use, you, you know, like a saw or a mill or drilling holes or anything like that. You know, a lot of times we cut or drill this stuff, we tend to use a lot of cutting fluids. Um, you know, just because stainless, it's, it's hard, it's much harder than steel, you know? So we like to use a lot of uh, heavy pressure and slow cutting speeds with a lot of cutting fluids or cutting oils or anything there just to help cut through this stuff. Once it's done, you know, hit it with some acetone, wipe it down really good. Brake clean, you know, pretty much takes care of everything. Maybe hit it with a stainless steel uh, wire brush. That's pretty much how I clean up all my stainless steel for the most part. Uh, hot tip you can actually cross contaminate your stainless with mild steel if you're using wire brushes or grinding wheels that have been used on mild steel. I actually have a specific wire brush and maybe this is a little bit overboard, maybe a little anal, but I have a specific wire brush for each type of material. And I'll actually write on the, uh, the wooden wire brush. I, I only use stainless steel wire brushes, but I'll, I'll write on the, uh, the wooden part of it. You know, this one's for aluminum or this one's for stainless or this one's for mild steel just so I don't mix them up. You know, I'll just take a Sharpie and write there, you know, right on the wooden handle. And that's going to prevent me from cross-contaminating. I'll also do this on specific grinding wheels um, that I know that I can use on steel, stainless, and aluminum. I'll, you know, if I use it on steel, I write steel on it so that I don't use that on my stainless or I don't use that on aluminum. Now, obviously, there's wheels that are specifically designed only for aluminum. So I don't need to mark those because I'm not going to grab like a milk wheel and, and try buffing out stainless or steel or anything like that. But if you have like a, a flap disc or a cutoff wheel, you know, I'll, I'll actually mark the material if, if I've used it on steel because you can actually cross contaminate uh, your steel and impregnate uh, steel grinding dust or steel particles from your wire brush or your grinding wheel into your stainless or your aluminum. And you may not notice it right away, but once you weld that piece out and you go ahead and put it in service and it gets a little bit of water on there, you're going to see little rust spots uh, throughout your steel or throughout your uh, aluminum and your stainless welds. So, you know, make sure label your stuff, keep it separated. You shouldn't have any issues with there. Try not to cross contaminate. Not really a good thing to do. So I always kept everything separate, keep it labeled. And, you know, that, that should keep you on the right track. Uh, the last one is aluminum. And this one requires just a little bit more, I wouldn't say prep work, but a little bit more uh, of a thought process going into it. Aluminum has a naturally occurring layer of aluminum oxide that forms on the metal or on the surface of the metal. Now, aluminum oxide, it melts roughly around 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit, while the aluminum underneath it melts at around 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. So removing this oxide layer is very simple. Get a stainless steel wire brush, the one that you marked aluminum on the handle, and, you know, just brush that joint in one direction, okay? So either push or pull the, the, the wire brush across the material only in one direction. Let me say that again. Brush only in one direction. This is especially the case if we're TIG welding. This really doesn't apply to uh, MIG welding for aluminum. The reason we want to brush in one direction is because aluminum is soft. So if I brush it one way, I'm lifting up the oxide layers. And then as I bring back the brush the other way, now I'm taking all the oxides that I just lifted off and I'm forcing them back into that soft metal and impregnating the weld joint with the aluminum oxide layer that I was trying to get rid of in the first place. And as soon as you go to light up on that and you weld it, you're going to be able to see that. Additionally, I like to wipe down all my aluminum after brushing with acetone or dechlorinated brake clean. 
Now, make sure, you know, like pause this and, and listen to it a couple times. Make sure that if you decide to use brake clean, that you use non-chlorinated or dechlorinated brake clean. Okay, and it's typically it's uh, the green can. Don't use the red can. Make sure it says dechlorinated brake clean on it. And that's because if you use chlorinated brake clean, it has chlorine in, in the brake clean itself. And as you uh, weld across the material that's been sprayed down with chlorinated brake clean, it's going to create something called phosgene gas, also known as mustard gas. Once that arc heats it up, it's, it's going to convert into this gas, and it's going to make you sick or worse, you know, it, it, potentially death hazard. So do not use chlorinated brake clean on anything and apply heat to it. So make sure you get the right can, and there's not much of a price difference. Pay attention to what you're using. Um, I like to do, I like to use the acetone or the dechlorinated brake clean after I lift the, or after I take all the oxides off of the wire brush, just to, you know, pick up any loose particles or any oils or anything that's, that's left on the surface. Additionally, I, I kind of prefer to use dechlorinated brake clean because it seems like acetone, you know, I don't know, for the most part, it seems to smear grease around a lot. So if I, if I do have to use acetone, I mean, that's pretty much what I use at the house for the most part on, on a lot of projects. If I have to use acetone, I'll wipe that in one direction too, because, you know, it's kind of, like I said, it smears things around. So I want to smear everything in one direction and, and just kind of do a couple different cleanings and, and make sure everything's nice and clean instead of scrubbing back and forth and just smearing shit everywhere. So take a little bit of time, wipe one direction, brush one direction, and you'll be on the right track. By taking these extra steps when you prep your material, I can guarantee you you're going to see a huge difference in how your puddle flows, how the welds look overall once you're done. You know, there's there's an old adage out there, and it says an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And prepping your material is like a prime example of that. So I, I guarantee if you take the time, put a little bit more prep in it, you're going to see instant results. So go ahead, try these little tricks. You can hit me up on Instagram. You know, I'll be more than happy to kind of, you know, check out your welds, give you some feedback. Uh, you know, if you have different prep, you know, prep methods that you guys use, go ahead and send them to me. You can send me, uh, you know, show at arcjunkies.com via email, or you can hit me up on uh, Instagram, uh, Arc Junkies Podcast. You know, I'd love to, if you guys have different tricks of the trade, to, you know, how you prep your stuff, go ahead and send it to me, man. I'm always open to learning new methods and, uh, you know, new tricks that are out there. So, Hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode of Just the Tip Tuesday. Make sure to tune in uh, for every Monday for regularly scheduled episodes of the Arc Junkies podcast, every Wednesday for Weld Wednesday with AWS. And if you have a topic that you want discussed on Just the Tip Tuesday, you can go ahead, hit me up on email, show at arcjunkies.com once again, or just drop something in my DMs there, Arc Junkies podcast on Instagram. Hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe out there. And until next time, make every weld better than your last.